My name is Brandon Harrington. I was born in Detroit, Michigan, 1977. Asked in one word to describe myself, I would simply say I am a human. My parents raised me uh, a two-parent home. They provided a lot of stability. I was a, a, a very happy-go-lucky kind of child. I was a studious child, so I loved like books, reading when I was real little. And then I got a little older, I got off into astronomy and I still love astronomy today. Even though I liked school, I would always cut out, go hang out, drink, and, and pretty much nothing. I had a, 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 a almost like a complex, a low self-esteem issue with my darker complexion. If you're darker than everyone else, then you, you know, you get picked on, you get made fun of, and most kids can deal with it and they move on. Unfortunately for me, I couldn't deal with it properly. I couldn't process it. So when I was going to Denby High School, I didn't, you know, I got fed up with being jugged at, picked on, talked about, laughed at, whatever the case might be. And so I chose a different group of friends. This group of friends was were, were, were a gang because I figured that these people are well respected or well accepted. In my mind, I determined that the more activity, the more negative conduct I could do, the more crimes I could commit, the more uh, insane my behavior was, the more I would earn what we would call respect in the gang. I was really upset that my orders weren't being followed and that particular day you know i i thought that i was being exposed as a fraud for pretending to be somebody that i was not i thought that i would lose my position i would lose my association with this group and i would go back to being just brandon i didn't want to be brandon i wanted to be this alter ego this creator that i this creation or character that i created First and foremost, my actions were criminal, period. I took another young man's life, an African-American young man. Uh, to my knowledge, he has both a daughter and granddaughter, and they never had the chance to grow up with him. The birthdays, the, the kiss on the knee, the boo-boos. Uh, who teaches you how to ride a bike? Who grills your first boyfriend? I took that away and I never ever want that to be, I don't want anybody to ever hear me speak and not hear that from me. When we are in court as very young people, we are the only people who are in jeopardy of losing our freedom. We're the only person in the court that, that, that has no real clue as to what's going on. We're not trained attorneys, we're not you know, judges, certified paralegals, litigation specialists. We have no clue as to what is going on. And I remember my judge specifically telling me, you are not ever eligible for parole. Do you understand that? And my response in open court was no. I thought that this occurred today, but I would go file an appeal. My family would hire me an attorney. And in three years, I'd be back in society. We typically say in there it takes about 10 years for a young person to really understand the severity or the magnitude of that sentence. Your family gets it. You know, my dad, I'm going to say this, my dad broke down and my dad is a, you know, he's a tough guy. And that shocked me. When you sentence a juvenile, a kid, to a life without parole sentence, you are giving he or she a torturous death sentence. Yes, our actions are horrible, and you have to consider us as young people before you determine that we deserve that ultimate punishment. You watch your family members and loved ones die or become so embarrassed by your conduct they don't they they they, they cho choose to not deal with you and you just feel abandoned you know that you have been sentenced to die and you, they're not going to kill you they're going to wait until you are 70 80 years old and you die from cancer or natural causes 
That was my experience in prison. Every day, all day, you wake up in the morning, you look up, you see the walls, and you say, damn, I'm still here. And then, you know, at night, that was your escape. You know, you may watch a little television, listen to a little music, and you would go to sleep. And at least from when you were asleep, you weren't in prison. And that was your only escape. We would see older guys, and I mean guys in their 70s, and we would talk to them, and they would tell us that they'd been in prison six, seven years before we were even born. And at this time, we were in our 40s. And you sat there and you said, wow, that's my future. That's what's next. I was in prison when COVID hit. And the older guys that I always, you know, looked up to, the guys that helped me, as we were saying, prison, the guys that raised me, they died. I remember being in the hole in level five and hearing a guy ask another guy, Hey, last week, man, how did you cut your stomach open so that you didn't really tear yourself up too bad? This is insane. You're going to cut your stomach open just to go to the hospital because you got to get out of here. You can't sit in this semi-solitary confinement any longer. I really, you know, vowed to myself was I wouldn't let prison kill me mentally. My prison stay, I took a lot of courses. I tried to really battle my life. I really tried to change, to grow, and to mature. So I did not feel, I wasn't one of those people that were hopeful that they would be released and knew deep down in their soul and their spirit that they were going to get out. I thought just the opposite until uh, June 25th of 2012. At one point, my attorney, Miss Erin Van Campen, who worked at Sato, Erin had asked me, hey, do you want to know what they did? I said, no. And I just assumed that they were seeking life on me. And I got some mail one day from Erin Van Campen, and it was from Kim Worthy's office, and it said that they were not going to seek life. And that was the day I got hope. That was the day I got hope. I was released November 9th of 2021. I get up that morning, I packed everything up, I gave everything away that I could give away. I shook hands with everybody in the penitentiary on my way out the door because I knew a lot of people. I walked out and I saw my daughter jumped out the car first, hadn't seen her in years, about six years. And so that was a huge, huge release, relief. But my mother always says, you walked out and you stopped and you look back. And I said, I look back because, you know, there are a lot of people that you leave behind, very good friends of yours. Since then, it's been a whirlwind. I went to school, got a commercial driver's license. I drive trucks. I uh, love doing that. That's fun. I've heard juvenile life and since we've been released talk about trauma. And there's one woman in particular, she blew me away with her speech. And she talked about how she was molested repeatedly sexually and how that led to her, you know, hanging out with the wrong group. And so nobody considers what happened to her as a child before they make that ultimate determination. I would like everybody to please focus on the individuals. What if a friend that you grew up with had been in this same situation? This would be a person you may be able to better relate to. Think about if he or she would have been, you know, caught up in something like this. They could have been with me and charged as a co-defendant. They never killed anybody and they may have never even intended to kill anybody. But I committed the criminal act and because they were with me, they were sentenced to life without parole. And you know this kid, you know this kid isn't, he, he's not rotten to the core, he's not a, 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 a bad seed. And so when you see us maybe from that perspective, maybe that helps you to see that I can't, I can't take a kid and give them a life without parole sentence and say, I did what was right. Again, I just briefly want to say, we understand the severity of our actions. We do, we do. 
we also understand who we are as people. We, we do have a lot of trauma that we're dealing with and we just don't know how to process it. That does not excuse or justify any behavior. It should mitigate at sensing though, at a very minimum, it should mitigate at sensing. Thank you.